Welcome on the third video of my series about home computers. In the first video, I talked about the basics of the digital technology and TTL circuits. And in the second one, I talked about how the CPU and the memory are working together. In this video, the aim is to talk about basic architecture of those 8-bit computers and then group them into generations and finally check out the constraints, reasons behind why these computers are quite similar. I'm going to draw a basic uh, architecture, really just what is necessary for a home computer. First of all, we need a CPU. As we discussed in the second video, we need memory and two kinds of memories. So we need ROM and as well as we need ROM what is the function of those. The ROM is responsible to store a static program, what we use to boot up the system and get a console. For 8-bit computers, most of the case, there was a part which handled the hardware and on top of that, there was the basic. The ROM is used to be able to load programs from some kind of storage, store the data, process it, and then we either just write it back or just turn off the computer. They are connected to the CPU through the memory and data bus. So there is a data bus. This one is 8-bit wide, most of the case, for 8-bit computers. And the address bus, so this is the data, and this is the address, which is so 0 to 7. And this one is 16 bit wide, so A0 to A15. There is also a circuit which is helping the CPU to select the, the proper memory, so ROM, RAM, or if there is any kind of equipment. So there is a glue logic. I do not draw it right now, but later on it will be important, so I will talk about it. What else do we need? I already mentioned some kind of storage. So we need a storage. Before home computers, they used a lot of things, for example, punch cards. But for our beloved 8-bit machines, most of the case it was a tape, or later on it was a floppy. What else do we need? What we need is a kind of input and output uh, system, so we can uh, work on the computer. Right now, I'm talking about a, a very simple solution, so we need a keyboard. And as well as some kind of video. For most of the 8-bit computers, they were connected to the data bus, but they were not connected to the address bus, except the video part. Typically, those computers store the screen in this memory, so if we had, let's say, 16K, it was somehow divided like, like 2 or 4 kilobyte was used for the display, and the rest was just available for the programs. You may ask, which component is the most important from this uh, picture? Storage was available at home. This is why they selected tape. As video display, they also selected something which was available at home, so the TV. If we are talking about the keyboard, it was available way before the home computers, so it was not the blocking factor for the proliferation of these computers. So we have three remaining components. It is interesting, the memory was available, but it was very, very expensive. But if you think about ZX81, which was a very cheap computer, okay, it was introduced in the 8081, but still with a single kilobyte of memory or even with 256 bytes of memory, it was possible to build a computer. So the only remaining component is the CPU. I think uh, the Zilog Z80 and the MOS 6500 series was much more important than any other components. Why do I say that? There were processors before those, so you may say there was the Intel 8080 or 
there was the Motorola 6800 series. So those were there, and they were available, anyone could buy them, but they were held expensive. So what happened? The funny story is in both cases, simply that there was an engineer or a group of engineers and they were not satisfied with the, with the bigger company. So they just left these companies and founded their own. So these two processors are totally different and still similar. Why do I say they are different and still similar? Because the first one, so the Zilog, designed by Federico Fagin and his team, and their aim was to build a better CPU than they had at Intel. They worked for Intel, but they were not satisfied. So they left Intel and started the Zilog company, and they built on their experience, so they extended the instruction set of the 8080, and the final product had more feature, but still it was easier to use. The story behind the other one, so the MOS 6500, is somewhat similar. But in this case, Chuck Pedal left Motorola, not Intel, because he was not satisfied. His plan was to build something very cheap and very simple. So instead of extending the instruction set, the 6500 is a simplified solution. The funny part, it was still being compatible with Motorola 6800. But the common part is much more important. So they were new on the market. They were very easy to use. I mean, design a computer based on them and they were cheap. So this is why those two CPUs were used for most of the home computers. After this intro, let's check out the generations. There are no official generations, so I'm defining my own generations based on the used components, as well as the feature set uh, the computers are providing. There was a generation zero. I do not define them as the first generation of home computers, because for me, a home computer is something which is easy to use, and they were not really easy to use. Additionally, they were not mass produced. I think it is easier to understand if I pick up an example, which is the Altair 8800. We can say it was kind of pre-home computer because it was already kind of affordable, but still using with these small switches and blinking LEDs, well, uh, it required some kind of knowledge, or it is better to say a lot of knowledge. So even if anyone could uh, buy it because it was not that expensive but still operating it or using it no matter how we, we say that it was not that easy typical these computers had intel cpu but they quickly switched over to z80 or the mos 6500 series and few kilobytes of memory it was easy to expand them with additional cards because some kind of standard bus, so the S100 bus, was introduced around that time. But I still consider these machines really, really connected to the home computers, because the first companies were started that time. Two good examples, the Microsoft with the Microsoft Basic, and also the Apple One was more of a kit computer than a real home computer. The first generation was different because of the feature set and especially because they were produced in volume. If you check out the components, they were built from catalog ICs. What do I mean? So there was a CPU, there was the memory, ROM, and a lot of ETL ICs. So there were no special components. To be honest, that way they are really similar to Generation Zero, but usability-wise, they were totally a different ballpark. The first three computers produced in volume was the Commodore PET, the Apple II, and TRS-80. All of them were mass-produced, and there were a lot of similarities between these computers. All of them were using BASIC as a kind of operating system or easy-to-use programming system. The user could load at the beginning from cassette tape and later on from floppy the programs. And if someone bought a system, he could take it at home, connect all the pieces, 
and just turn it on and use it. Of course, they were not as easy to use as something today, but still it was not required to be an engineer or some kind of engineering student or at least a hobbyist to operate these machines. However, all of these machines were somehow limited. The reason behind was very simple, because all the components, especially the memories, were held expensive. If you check out the price for a kit computer from the same time, it is visible the kit price for the CPU and the S100 bus compatible card was $269, while the memory board with 8 kilobyte costed more. And in case someone required even more memory, so let's say 16K, it really pumped up the price. In turn, they were also similar because of two things. At the beginning, the market was not clear. There was no such market. Because of that, everybody used just catalog ICs. So the same TTL ICs, the same memory ICs, the same ROMs or CPUs, and the very same basic from Microsoft. Commodore at the beginning went to Microsoft, so they licensed from them. But also Apple figured out, because Wozniak tried to write his own variant of BASIC, but at the end they also just licensed it from Microsoft. The other limitation was the price. It was not visible how many computers could they sell or to whom, so it was not a kind of fixed thing. Based on different books and memoirs from Wozniak or Chuck Pebble, they were really surprised and it was hard to them to supply enough computers at the beginning. When they started to sell them, they estimated to sell something like few thousand, but at the end they sold ten thousands of them. It was really a surprise for the companies, so the three, the Byte magazine, called them as Trinity, so it was the TRS-80, the Apple II and the Commodore Pad. I also had the Ford column just to have a kind of typical machine from this generation. CPU-wise, the TRS-80 used the Z80, while the Apple and the Commodore machine used the 6502. Frequency-wise, the TRS-80 looks faster with its uh, 1.77 MHz, but in fact it was even a bit slower than the more efficient 6502 at 1 MHz. As I already mentioned, a typical machine used one of those CPUs running somewhere between 1 and 3 MHz. The ROM was expensive. Because of that, all the three had a 4 kilobyte variant. The internet expansion of the TRS-80 was limited to 16K, so it could have either 4, 8 or 16 kilobytes. The typical Apple II was the same, but it had a limitation of 48K. As you can see, I put the price tag just to see how expensive it was. Since this is the price tag from 77 and we had inflation since then, it would worth more than five times more. So the 2.6K would be something like 13.5 today. The PET 2001 was limited internally to 32K, but it was in pair of the other two. A typical computer from this era had something like around 16K. They were also similar if we check out the ROM size. The TRS-80 had at the beginning 4K, but after they introduced level 2 BASIC, it was also upgraded to 16K. It was the very same for the Apple II. Colder Pad had a little bit more, 18K slash 20K with the new BASIC, but the difference is not significant. Storage-wise, all the three started with tape drives. Later on, of course, floppy drives were introduced for all of those, but the Pad had a special feature because it had this inbuilt dataset. Display-wise, at the beginning, all the three machines were limited just to capital characters. Monitor-wise, the TRS-80 was in the middle. It had a monochrome output. It was compatible with the, the TV standard, so anyone who had just the base machine could use a TV as a display. It was also able to display bitmap picture, but the resolution was really, really limited. The Apple II was the smartest of the three, because it was able to produce a color screen, Wozniak had a really bright idea how to manipulate the output to produce colors, but because of the limited memory, it was not really useful at the beginning. 
Later on, when they introduced more and more memory, because the memory became cheaper, they could start to use those bigger resolution, I mean high resolution color modes. It is easy to understand why, because the screen itself was in the memory and you use a high resolution color screen, which consumes a lot of memory, then there is not enough memory for the program. So it was a kind of deal between the screen and the program memory. The Commodore PET had only text modes and a monochrome screen. It sounds very limited, but on the other hand, it was able to display PET's key, which is similar to the ASCII, and it was possible to create semi-graphical character-based screens. A typical machine in the first generation had a TV-compatible output. At the beginning it was monochrome, but as they developed they introduced colors and then also a kind of graphical mode. But beside the technical figures there was another aspect, which was the software. First of all, BASIC became a kind of standard and the BASIC is really an easy to use thing. Anyone who put a little bit of effort into it was able to use these computers. And because of that, there were more and more developers, which means there were more and more different kind of programs. This was the generation where the first spreadsheets and really popular text editor programs appeared. So it is the time when next to the hardware market, the software market also developed and established itself. The second generation was not a revolution, but the evolution of the first generation. There were more and more companies on the market, and of course there was a lot of room for improvements. Because of the higher volume, the prices started to drop. It included the CPU, the memories, and all the spare parts. Few companies designed a new computer, which was way cheaper than anything else on the market. The other strategy was to design something fancy. Fancy means more features, so better graphics, better sound, and so on. This generation started to appear at the end of the 70s and early 80s, but they were coming next to each other until mid 80s. But who missed the starting gun really missed the market. So if someone arrived too late, it also meant that he missed the opportunity because software became more and more important. Companies also improved their computers step by step, so there were few families. The companies designed special circuits for their needs. Most of them used this technique to reduce the amount of integrated circuits to a single one, that way the glue logic could be integrated into a single circuit. Let me give you a few examples for the hardware changes as well as design strategies. Sinclair was famous about their cheap computers. ZX80 and 81 were really, really cheap, especially if we compare to the other computers on the market. But they had their own limitations. That time, one kilobyte memory was really the low end. Even if we compare it to the first generation, it was not so good. On the other hand, they were very cheap. And what made it possible? They were built from just a handful of circuits. So simplifying the whole computer and reducing the memory size, it helped to build a dirty cheap solution. Their next computer, so the Spectrum, also followed this strategy. They tried to build a cheap computer, but they pumped it up a little bit, so they added color whatsoever. Another example, which was the other end, is the Texas Instruments TI 99-4A. This computer arrived in time. It has really a good feature because it had a sound chip as well as it handled sprites. So on paper, it was really a good computer. What was its problem? There were two issues with this computer. First one was the company's policy because they were not really supportive towards the developers. The developers didn't like this computer, so there were not so many new programs. The second problem was not with the computer itself, but the competition. Commodore released VIC-20, which was not really as good as the Texas computer, but on the other hand, it was really cheap. The VIC-20 had less memory, the graphics was not as good as the Texas, 
but Commodore was able to build it cheaper than the Texas did it with their own computer. How did they manage that? It is quite simple. They used the previous pet series. They reused a lot of things. They reused the basic, they reused the kernel. So what you can find in the ROM, it is quite similar to a pet computer. Also, they produced most of the circuits they used for the computer. They moved the production to Hong Kong. So they used all the opportunities to make it cheap. On top of that, they supported the developers. When TI started to reduce the price of their computer, so undercut the Commodore one, Commodore was able to reduce the price. Then TI also reduced the price, so it spiraled down to a price war. At the end, the retail price for a VIC-20 was somewhere around $100, which was less what Texas spent on its own computer to build one. After Texas Instruments lost a lot of money, they gave up the home computer market. My last example for the evolution is the C64 itself. You may ask, what kind of evolution am I talking about? Because they were really compatible and they built it from 82 till 92. They sold 10 millions of those computers without any kind of change. And when I say without any kind of change, that's not true. They simplified and made cheaper and cheaper to build a C64. That way they were able to reposition from a mid-price computer to an entry-level one. If you put next to each other the PCB of an early model and the late one, it really shows what I'm talking about. Of course, other competitors made the very same, so Atari also simplified its computers and Spectrum also stepped forward. They chose a different path, so instead of simplification, they put more and more features as they step forward. For this generation, I also selected three computers. The first one is Atari 800XL. It is representing the Atari 800 line. The second one is the C64, while the third one is the ZX Spectrum. Both the Atari and the Commodore models use the 6502 compatible CPU, but the clock speed of the Atari model was much higher. The ZX Spectrum used the Z80. Its clock speed was higher, but still IPC-wise it was a little bit slower. Most of the 8-bit computers used either Z80 or something from the 6502 family. The memory size of Atari and Commodore was 64 kilobytes. The cheapest Spectrum had just 16 kilobytes of memory, but the typical was 48. Later models had even more memory, so 128 kilobytes, but since Z80 was able to address at the same time only 64 kilobytes, they had to use paging. Paging means, for example, you have 16K pages, and you can see only four pages at the same time. Like in a book, you can see two pages, but you can flip back and forth. That way you can change which page do you read. The ROM size also increased, and the ROM and the memory was paged on the C64 and the 800XL. So for example, on the C64, either you could see the memory or the ROM. So the programmers could directly reach all the features of the hardware. So they could program everything and when they didn't need the ROM, I mean the routines from the ROM, they just map the memory and use it to store data or code. This paging was typical for the second generation computers, but of course there were computers where it was not true. Storage-wise, floppy drives started to take over the tapes. For cheap computers like ZX Spectrum, it was still typical, because if someone had the money to buy a better storage for ZX Spectrum, it was much more common to step up to a better computer like a C64. For C64, the cost of a floppy drive was almost the same as a C64. It was cheaper for the 800XL, but still it costed a lot of money. Display-wise, there was no big change. The output of these computers were compatible with TVs. The changes were twofold. First of all, most of the computers became color, but the technique behind was a little bit twisted. Still, the memory had not enough capacity to have big pictures, so what they did, they selected blocks like 8 pixel by 8 pixel, and in this block, 
the computers were able to display two or four colors. It was possible to set the color for these blocks in a separated memory range, and typically these were even separated memory chips. For example, in the C64, it was called the color ROM. That was true for the ZX Spectrum and the typical computer, but few of them had even more features. They were able to handle sprites. The sprite is a small picture which can be put on the screen and move separately. For example, we have a game where we have a small figure which is just jumping over, and we have few more and those are trying to catch the first one. And the chipset itself is able to handle this price, position them, check the collision, and so on. I haven't listed here, but even sound capabilities step forward. Other had a multi-channel sound chip, but the SID in the C64 was really a big jump. I'm pretty sure almost everybody can remember this small chip tune. The third generation of home computers were based on 16-bit CPUs and in this video I won't talk about those because it is already getting too long. I would like to close this video with a story about a latecomer. The development of the Enterprise was announced in 1983. It was based on Z80, the speed, the feature set, so everything was very promising, but they were late. It was not available until 1985. And at the time there was the Amiga and the Atari ST. It is easy to say they failed because they were late. The development was too long, so simply they just missed the moving target. In my next video I plan to talk about what really hit the target, so the Atari ST and the Amiga series, and of course I will add some PC and Apple as well. I really hope you enjoyed this video and you will join me for the next one. Goodbye.